In this tutorial, we are going to cover how to use Pilot to compute static greens functions that can be used in inversion for fault slip. The setting for this problem is a horizontal cross section of a strike slip fault shown here. Our domain is 100 kilometers long perpendicular to the fault and 150 kilometers long in the direction along the strike of the fault. We have two materials with different elastic properties on either side of the fault. We have, uh, we label one elastic X negative because it's on the minus X side of the fault and elastic X positive because it is on the positive side of the fault. And we'll consider a, a portion of slip along the central portion of this through growing strike slip fault. There, this, this is, corresponds to examples uh, strike slip 2D and our greens function portion covers steps four, five, and six. In step four, we will look at variable slip and Dirichlet boundary conditions. This is our fake uh, earthquake that we will be inverting for in terms of the fault slip. Then in step five, we will use our static greens functions with the Dirichlet boundary conditions to compute uh, the impulse response uh, of the displacements from the fault slip. And then in step six, it will not actually be a pilot simulation, but we will use the results from step four and five uh, to invert for the slip in step four using the greens functions from step five. Steps one, two, and three uh, are currently not covered in tutorials, but they are very similar to the elasticity prescribed slip tutorials covered in uh, another tutorial. The concepts covered in this tutorial are generation of a simple mesh using GMesh. We will uh, generate randomly located synthetic GPS stations using NumPy. We will simulate a co-seismic slip with variable slip along strike. We will generate our static greens functions along the fault. Uh, we will perform a simple inversion of the, our synthetic data using NumPy. And then we'll plot our inversion results using matplotlib and h5pi to access our uh, data that was generated with Pilot. For our generating our GMesh, this is our construction of our geometry. We have a through going strike slip fault. We have four points that define the boundary of the domain, point one, two, three, and four. We have points five and six that define the fault. And we have curves. Uh, and in GMesh, curves have orientation or direction. They go from the starting point to the ending point of each curve. So we will first construct points then we'll construct curves from each of those points. And then we'll generate surfaces using curve loops that uh, connect those curves uh, into a surface. So for example, uh, to construct the material on the left side, this surface, we'll start with this curve. It goes in this direction. So it will be positive uh, using the, the orientation of those curves in a counterclockwise direction. When we do this one, we'll have to reverse the direction of the fault so that uh, we have consistent direction in all of our curves. So when we create the final mesh using GMesh, some things to keep in mind is that each curve in GMesh has a direction or orientation. The direction is from the starting point to the ending point. When we connect curves into surfaces, you must connect those curves in a consistent direction. We connect the curves in a counterclockwise direction in our cases. And to reverse the direction of curve, use the negative physical tag value or minus the variable name uh, in our Python script. This is the mesh we'll be generating. It is, uh, has a uniform resolution along the length of the fault. And then the mesh size gradually increases with distance from the fault. In this case, it's increasing rather slowly. So you don't see much variation in cell size uh, with distance perpendicular to the fault. So the way we generate our GMesh is a uh, mesh file is we use the Python interface. This is much easier to use and much more sort of sophisticated than having to do everything through the graphical user interface. It also allows us to tap into any other Python modules that we've installed. For example, we can make use of geographic projection libraries that it come with, uh, with Pilot. And uh, we also can make use of uh, some utility functions that we've included. So we have within Pilot created a gmesh underscore utils uh, 
Python module that provides uh, an interface for easily generating a mesh and creating and tagging uh, boundaries for use in boundary conditions. In generating the mesh, uh, we have a template Python application. It's called Generate Mesh. We have to uh, implement three functions, one for creating the geometry, one for tagging the geometry for materials and boundary conditions, and then generating the mesh. So we create an application class that inherits from uh, Generate Mesh. We have a bunch of comments associated with the geometry of the domain. Here I've labeled my points just for reference so I don't have to refer to the diagram. I have defined variables for the, uh, the length of the domain in the x direction, the length of the domain in the y direction. Uh, and then I have a constructor that defines uh, what types of cells that I can use. Uh, in this case, I'm saying the defaults are triangular cells. Um, I could also uh, consider quadrilaterals. And the default file name is mesh underscore try dot mesh. Um, so that means uh, I can just say write the file and I don't have to provide the cell type or the file name. Now I have my routine for creating the geometry. I define a local variable for the length of the domain in the x direction, the y direction. And then I start by giving the points in the lower left corner. Uh, I'm going to center the domain at the origin, 0, 0, using a Cartesian coordinate system. So uh, my uh, point, my coordinates of my of x and y in the lower left corner are minus the width of the domain and minus the length of the domain. So now I can easily create uh, my bounding points. So GMesh, uh, I'm using the built-in geometry engine. I just add a point with the coordinates. So x1, y1, then I go x1 and then add in the length of the domain in the x direction in y1. My point three is up in the upper right. So I add the length in the x direction, length in the y direction to my uh, x1 and y1. And then my upper left coordinate is x1 and y1 plus ly. Now for the faults, uh, it's centered on um, x equals zero, but I'm gonna do everything reference to my x1 and uh, y1. So uh, its coordinates are x1 plus half the length of the domain in the x direction. Uh, and then at y1 and y1 plus ly for 0.6. So that defines my six coordinates of points in the geometry. So that's these points shown in orange, 0 0.1, 2, 3, 4 for the boundary and then five and six. So now that I have those points, I wanna correct, connect those points um, into curves. And so I create curves and I give them the labels here. Those match the ones that I showed uh, in the geometry here. So I'm gonna preface all my curves with C underscore. On the Y negative, I'm gonna have curves one and two. So C Y neg one, C Y neg two. Uh, positive, just one uh, on the positive boundary, just x pos top, y pos one, y pos two, x negative, x negative curve for the fault. So I'm going to create each of those curves going in the direction that I show here in the diagram, going back to my Python script. So y negative one is from one to five, two is from five to two, x positive is from point two to point three, y positive is two is from three to six, y plus one is from six to four, x negative is four to one, and the fault it goes from 0.5 to 0.6. So now I have all of those curves. I want, I want to connect those curves into surfaces. So first I create a curve loop that defines the boundary of my surface. And so I string together uh, the four bounding curves. So in this case, I have four curves. For my left side, I have y negative one, the fault, y positive one and x negative one. On the uh, surface to the right side of the fault, I do y negative two, x positive, y positive two, and then I need to reverse the direction of the curve on the fault to form uh, a consistent orientation. So I take minus the variable name, that's minus the physical tag uh, identifier in GMesh. Um, and then I create a surface using, uh, a planar surface using that curve loop. So I do that for each side. Then I synchronize the geometry within GMesh to make sure it knows everything about uh, how the entities are related to each other. Uh, and then I can start marking my boundary and generating the mesh. 
So I define a different function to mark the boundary and uh, I can refer to any variable names that I've stored within my object. That's the self dot um, uh, within marking the boundaries. And so first I'll define my materials. I use our helper uh, data class called material group where I provide it the tag. Uh, this will be the label value within Pyleth. And then the entities, these are the information that are uh, the surfaces that are being used for the material. So I have a surface X underscore X negative for the negative side of the fault, S underscore X pause for the positive side of the fault. Two materials, this just creates the tag and the entities. Then I actually create the physical group uh, using the helper function that we provide in the DMesh utilities. Uh, but you'll see it's very easy on the user interface. All I have to do is specify the tag and the entities um, and then just copy these lines um, to produce the physical groups. Similar for the vertex groups, um, I'm going to mark all four external boundaries plus the fault. I'll give a tag that is unique to these. So I'll just go 10, 11, 12, 13, and then 20 for my fault, just to, as a visual identifier that the fault is different than my external boundaries. Uh, I have a 2D domain, so then my boundaries are on 1D. And so the dimension is one and the entities uh, for the X negative and X positive, I just have a single curve, Y negative and Y positive, I have two curves, uh, Y neg one, Y neg two, Y pause one, Y pause two. For my fault, I have a single curve. Um, the directions don't matter because I'm just marking things. Uh, my Fault is through growing, so I don't have to worry about buried edges. I just have a single uh, fault vertex group. I need to create physical groups for those two. And so I use my GMesh utils uh, module to create the physical group for those groups. So that's marking all the boundaries using the geometry. And uh, that'll translate everything into the GMesh file that will be read into Pilot. Now I need to generate the mesh itself. And I'm going to set the discretization size with a geometric progression from distance to the fault. So I turn off the default mesh sizing options uh, in DMesh. Now I'm going to do it. It takes two steps to create that geometric progression and discretization size. First, I need to define the distance from the fault. So I create a without when in DMesh, which is called a field, and it's based on distance. So I give it uh, a distance field and assign it to the variable name field distance. Then I am going to define that distance based on a list of curves. So I tell it that field, here are uh, the curves to use to calculate distance from. And I'm just going to use the single curve for the fault. So everything is going to be based on distance from the, my fault. And now I want to create the discretization size based on that distance. And I'm going to use an analytical function that defines what that discretization size here, what, what it is. It is actually provided uh, within my GMesh utils to do the geometric progression. I need to tell GMesh I'm doing an analytical function evaluation. So that's creating another field that's called math eval. Um, I assign it, a, assign it to the variable field size. I then uh, am going to uh, use that field size later. Uh, but I'm going to pass in to get my discretization size. I pass in the field distance. I'm going to use a minimum discretization size of four kilometers with a geometric growth of 5%. So that's a bias of 1.05. Here's my mathematical expression. And I create my field size using a function. So that's what the F is uh, provided by uh, this uh, variable. Then I tell GMesh to use this field size for the background mesh size. And so it's, uh, I create a field set as background mesh uh, with the field size. Uh, and that's all it takes to specify a variable discretization size. It's an analytical function as a function of space that's based on distance. You'll see it takes about uh, eight or 10 lines to, to do that, which is quite compact and simple to do. And you can do, uh, GMesh provides a variety of functions you can use to divide field sizes that can control the mesh size. Um, if I have a quadrilateral mesh, GMesh first will generate a 
triangular mesh, and then it'll recombine those triangles to form rectangles and uh, or quadrilaterals. And so this is the meshing algorithm that I use. If I just have a conventional triangular mesh, which I'll be using in this case, I can just say generate the 2D mesh. And in either case, I will do optimal, I'll optimize it, that mesh, but improve the quality by using Laplacian 2D smoothing. Uh, and then at the bottom of my script, I just have uh, this sort of boilerplate that creates the application and then calls its main function, which is provided in the DMesh utilities. So let's run this script. Now that we've walked through it, and so we can start by uh, running the running GMesh and with the help options to see what options are available. It takes a second to start up the Python interpreter. Uh, and so I have, I can do dash dash geometry to just generate the geometry. If I want to do the geometry and mark the boundary, I can just do dash dash mark, uh, generate the mesh, write the mesh, provide a name, provide the file name for the output, write an ASCII instead of binary, and uh, change the cell type. And finally, I can uh, invoke the GUI interface uh, at the end of whatever steps that I run. So let's just, just generate the geometry and be able to look at it. So we can do uh, geometry GUI. Uh, that generates our geometry. It's pretty simple. As you can see, here's I have my curves. I have my points. Uh, not particularly interesting. I can show what happens when I mark the boundary. And so if I do mark, it'll rerun, it'll run the geometry and then it'll mark it. And now I can do tools visibility and I'll bring up a window that shows my marked entities. So I have my material on the left side, material ID one, material ID two. I have my boundaries, X negative, X positive, Y negative, Y positive. I have my faults. And then I have a lower dimension marked entities uh, for the uh, X for my boundaries as well. Uh, the one thing to note is that uh, my material create physical group automatically named these uh, material ID one colon two, material ID colon two, material ID colon one, and material ID colon two. And this is just a way uh, that Pilot, when it reads in the mesh using Petsy, will be able to uh, identify that the label values are set and that the label associated with the materials is material ID. Um, this is done automatically, um, but it's a it's a based on using uh, Pepsi to read in the mesh uh, from GMesh and a combination of how we mark things in Pilot. Um, it's important that things are marked this way. The boundaries are much more are more flexible. Um, but you need both the name and the physical tag uh, to identify the boundary. Um, this is different than in Qubit where you just need the name. This is all documented in the pilot menu. So let's generate the mesh so we can do generate and the GUI. And it just takes a couple seconds. This is what we saw in the diagram. I have the two materials on each side colored differently. My boundary is shown in blue, and I have a slightly finer discretization close to the uh, along the fault than I do at the boundaries. And you can here you can on this boundary you can sort of see that geometric progression. And I do just five percent. You could do uh, ten percent. Uh, and I can show. Let's look at what would that look like. So all I have to do is change that geometric progression, is to adjust the one line, uh, and change this bias to. Let's do 1.15 just to make it uh, a bit larger. And there you can see a more rapid increase in, in discretization size with distance from the fault. Uh, and this just shows the power of, of GMesh and its ability to use those field sizes based on distance to set the mesh size. If I wanted to actually generate the mesh and save it to a file, I would do uh, dash dash write. And it would save it. I've already generated that file and I don't want to overwrite it. So I'll just keep it uh, the way it is. And I'll revert my script back to what it was originally. So now I've generated the mesh and we can move on to the next step.
So now we want to run our simulations to generate our greens functions uh, within the example strike slip 2D directory. We have a readme file that gives a brief description of the examples and how to run them, our parameter files that all end in .cfg. We have our generate DMesh Python script. Uh, we will go over uh, the script that we use to generate our synthetic GPS sites. These are random locations distributed along the faults and uh, both perpendicular to the faults and along the strike. We have a Python script for inverting for the synthetic data. We have our files generated by gmesh.msh, our spatial database files for our uh, fault slip, and a viz directory for pair view Python scripts and uh, some other Python scripts for, that visualize the results. And then our output directory where we will dump all of our output from our simulations as well as our inversion. A little bit of background at Green's functions. We're computing the deformation due to a unit, one meter of slip at the fault vertices for use in inverting for the fault slip. The slip decreases linearly to zero at the surrounding uh, vertices. This is for a basis order of one. Uh, and that is the currently the only supported basis order for generating our fault slip patches. Uh, if you use Okada dislocations in general, you would generate a uniform uh, slip over a small patch. Uh, this is a similar approach, but not quite equivalent um, because we have a linear variation. Uh, you can think of it as sort of a little tent uh, around each vertex. Uh, and these are then summed up uh, to create what the overall uh, slip is on the surface. Pilot will automatically interpolate the response to user uh, responses of the deformation to user specified points. It uses a Python, uh, sorry, a pilot object called output solution points, and we'll look at that in our output file. And uh, this provides this mechanism of computing static Green's functions provide the ability to compute Green's functions for arbitrary complex elastic structure and topography. In this case, we have a material contrast across the fault. Uh, and this is not something that could be handled uh, by uh, just a generic uh, Okada code that assumes uniform material properties. Uh, so here's our step four. We're gonna create variable slip along the length of the fault. We'll have uh, zero displacement and we have clamp boundaries on the X positive, X negative. So we have zero displacement in both the X and Y directions on our two boundaries. Uh, here's how we translate the physics into our uh, uh, diagram. So here's what we have in terms of a, a diagram. Our solution field has both displacement and Lagrange multiplier as associated with creating this jump in displacement across the fault. We're solving the static elasticity equation. So the divergence of the stress is equal to zero. We have on the negative side of the fault, one set of elastic properties another set of elastic properties on the positive side of the fault. On the negative uh, X boundary, we have zero displacement boundary conditions, same thing on the X positive side of the fault. And then our slip varies as a function of Y along the length of the fault. How do we translate in that into parameters? Well, for our uh, solution fields, we have both a Lagrange multiplier and the displacement. So use our predefined container, which contains both of those. Uh, this is uh, what we always have when we have a fault uh, in elasticity. Uh, and for step four, we're going to increase our resolution by using a basis order of two. So we have not just a linear variation between uh, within a cell, but we have a quadratic variation. So we're going to add uh, both uh, cross terms instead of just being a function of x and y. It's going to be a function of x, y, x, y, x squared, and y squared. Uh, and that'll give us a higher resolution for the given uh, discretization size. And this is just mainly to show off the resolution of pilot and its ability to do second order basis functions that we haven't had in the past. For our material properties, we have two materials, one on the negative side of the fault, one on the positive side of the fault. Uh, here, I'm just gonna show you the parameters for the negative side of the fault. So I have a description. I give it a label value of one, that was our physical uh, tag within the GMesh Python script. We're going to have uniform material properties. So I'm just going to give them, uh, use a uniform database right here in the .cfg file. 
that uh, database has a description. It's a elastic properties for X negative. It has values of density Vs and Vp, density of 2,500 kilograms per meter cubed, Vs of three kilometers per second, Vp of 5.29 kilometers per second. We have a basis order um, for our, our material properties that is uh, uniform, so basis order of zero, and we're gonna output our stress and strain with a basis order of zero. Um, we don't really care about the stress and strain in this case, and the fact that we're using a basis order of two, we should actually probably use a basis order of one uh, to really capture the linear variation of stress and strain that uh, is being resolved by the solution, even if we don't include it in the output. Boundary conditions, we have uh, two Dirichlet boundary conditions, one on the X negative face, one on the X positive face. Uh, the name of the physical group and uh, its value is given by the label and label value. We're constraining X and Y, so that's degree of freedom zero and one. We have zero displacement, so we use the zero dB uh, boundary condition database um, that's just handy to use when we have zero values and we have some the same thing repeated uh, for the X negative. So this should be down here, should be X negative, not X positive. For our fault, we have one a single fault, so our interface's array is fault. Uh, we have to give it the label and label value that corresponds to the name of the physical group uh, and value within our GMesh script. We're gonna have variable slip along the fault, so we're gonna use a simple D, DB that specifies that variable as a function of Y. Uh, and we have it in a separate spatial data file called slip underscore variable dot spatial DP. This is what that slip distribution looks like. It's not meant to look like any real earthquake. It's just some random points that I picked that has uh, some variations along strike with a couple, two peaks, uh, some undulations in between, slip extends along strike. This is centered on the middle of the fault from uh, roughly minus 20 kilometers to plus 20 kilometers. Um, for our um, slip distribution. This is our random location of GPS stations. I generated, uh, this is not a uniform distribution. They tend to be closer to the fault, but they're uniformly distributed along strike. I gave it enough GPS stations that we could resolve those spatial variations in slip. And this is something you can play around with if you want to experiment with the example is both uh, the distance along strike where you put the GPS stations, um, how well they're confined with distance perpendicular to the fault, um, as well as how many stations you have. Um, and so uh, we'll look at this uh, script in just a minute. Here's our input for our um, simulation. We have our mesh file. We have our pilot app file. That's the parameter common to all the steps within the example. Uh, that includes steps one through three that we're not covering in this tutorial. Our step 04 variable slip, our variable slip spatial database file, and then our uh, GPS station file that's the list of those stations. And it includes both the station cords and station code and the coordinates. Um, so let's look at those files. We need to pull up uh, what they look like. So we'll switch from our mesh generation. Let's start with um, the pilot app file. So uh, this is common information across all of our strike slip examples. And so we have a bunch of metadata um, that just says what features we're gonna use. So it helps us find this uh, examples demonstrating various features. We have the journal info files that control what information is written to stand it out. So we'll write information about our problem, which is a, uh, with the pilot app, the default is a time dependent problem. So um, yeah, we also have our solution, reading the mesh using Petsy, the materials, isotropic layer elasticity, our boundary conditions, Dirichlet time dependent, our fault, and any Petsy options that are being set automatically. And that controls all the information that is written to stand it out. If you want to reduce this, you can mark these, uh, turn these ones to zero or just delete those lines. You can also look through the pilot component section of the manual and any compiled components we're using, you can turn on their corresponding journal information to get more information to standard out. 
Um, some don't display much information, others display uh, considerably more information. Uh, we read our mesh using Petsy, and so our reader is a mesh IO Petsy. That's not the default, so we have to set it. Uh, we're going to read our file name mesh underscore try dot uh, mesh. We the default's a two D. Uh, sorry, the default is a three D Cartesian coordinate system, so we want a two D Cartesian coordinate system. So we set the spatial dimension to two. For our overall problem settings, we're going to set up. We're going to use a nonlinear solver to ensure that our residual and Jacobian are consistent. If we had multiple uh, linear solve iterations, we would uh, recognize that something was wrong with our problem setup or our implement, final implement, implementation in Pilot, and we would need to fix things. Uh, we're going to start with a default quadrature order of one, basis order of one for the displacement and Lagrange multiplier. As I mentioned, for step four, we're going to increase these to a basis order of two. Uh, we're going to use a uh, scale to normalize the time scale by uh, use a relaxation time of 100 years. So uh, a non-dimensional time of one will be equal to 100 years. We then have our bound, uh, sorry, our output. We're going to output on, on the domain as well as the top and bottom boundaries. For the top and bottom boundaries, we need to change the type of what is output these are on the output of the solution boundary. So we need to change the type to output solution boundary. We then need to specify what those boundaries are. So we give it the label and label value um, for those two. So that's what that part is for. The materials, we have two different materials, um, to minus X side and the plus X side of the fault. We then have our elastic, uh, properties for each material, we give those in a uniform spatial database. So here they are shown for the minus X side of the fault. X positive side, you'll notice that we have uh, a different uh, shear wave speed. We keep the same P wave speed, same density, but we've increased uh, the shear wave speed um, considerably higher uh, from three kilometers a second to uh, 4.24. All the other parameters are the same between the two sides of the fault. We all of our simulations have a single fault, so we uh, just label it fault. It's given by um, the label and label value is the fault in, in the physical tag group uh, of 20. Uh, we're going to output the slip on the fault. And our boundary conditions default is uh, here for these set of simulations is Dirichlet time dependent boundary conditions, both X and Y constrained on both boundaries using a zero. Uh, DB spatial database. So now let's look at step four, the variable slip. There's not much in this file. We need to uh, define some, um, metadata specific to this particular case. Uh, we say it's prescribed slip. Uh, we say uh, it's a static simulation. Uh, what are the arguments and so forth? Then we then define uh, uh, file names for output. We dump the parameters to the output directory using uh, this file name. It's going to be in a JSON file format that we can read in our parameter viewer. Uh, the progress monitor, this is uh, mainly useful for when we have multiple time steps or in the greens functions, multiple impulses. It'll give us an estimate of when the simulation will end. All of our uh, other output parameters or output files will start with step 04 underscore variable slip and uh, be marked by the name of the component, like the domain, the top boundary, bottom boundary, or the fault or the boundary conditions. We then define our problem. As I mentioned, we're going to use a basis order of two in step four. So we need to increase our quadrature order of two to give full integration. <clears throat> we have to define our uh, observers for the GPS stations. We, so we need to change our default output of observers to the domain top boundary, bottom boundary, as well as our GPS stations. The GPS stations, that type of output is output solution points. So we uh, set that here. Uh, for that as GPS stations, we need to provide the list of the station codes and coordinates and tell it what coordinate system we're using. We're gonna use the same coordinate system as we use for the mesh. Um, so that's the default 2D Cartesian, uh, Cartesian coordinate system. And we have to specify it's in dimension two. And here's the file name for our GPS stations. And finally, we need to specify that uh, 
the variable uh, slip along a fault for our kinematic source time function, which in this case, the default is a step function. We'll use that. Um, and so it's in the, on the file slip underscore variable dot spatial DB. So let's look at what that looks like. In this case, we're going to use a linear variation and use 11 points. So I need to capsulate my entire length of the fault. So I'm going to go all the way from my, uh, plus 99 to minus 99 in terms of my coordinates. But most values are going to be specified. This is piecewise linear, so I don't have to have uniformly spaced coordinates. I can just use which ones I need. So generally, over the length of the fault, I'm using the discretization size of five kilometers. So piecewise linear, uh, five kilometers. You'll see that uh, I am using uh, the um, slip components are left lateral and opening, and well as I can give it a local initiation time, I'm going to use units of centimeters. I have 11 locations. I'm specifying piecewise linear variations, so my data dimension is one. Uh, and so I go from zero to 30 centimeters, 40 centimeters, down to 20, 60, up to 80, back down to 30, 10, and then zero. So I've confined the slip between uh, minus 20 and 20 in the y direction. Um, and uh, as shown in the previous diagram, let's look how I generate my fake GPS stations. So that's generate uh, GPS stations.py. This is a Python script. It looks a lot like my, the Python script that I use to generate the mesh. Um, you can just run it uh, from the command line. It has uh, command line arguments. The defaults uh, are all set. So if you and just run the script without any parameters, it'll generate the defaults, uh, which are shown. Um, you can change the random seed, you can change uh, the number of stations, uh, the type of distribution, and so forth. And um, you'll look here, uh, I initialize the random seed to a value, number of stations to 200, a Gaussian distribution uh, perpendicular to the fault, and uniform distribution along the strike. Um, uh, maximum distance uh, is 50 kilometers from the fault. And here's my file name. Uh, within my main, I parse the command line arguments, create the points, and then write them out. Uh, here I create the points. So if it's a Gaussian distribution, I create a standard distribution that's uh, a standard deviation for my Gaussian distribution that's one third the dist maximum distance. Uh, generate random. Uh, distribution in the x direction, use a uniform distribution in the y direction that goes from my over my maximum distance. Uh, if I have a uniform distribution, then I just do uniform in x, uniform in y from minus maximum distance to plus maximum distance. Uh, I create a list, an array of those points. Then when I write them out, I'm going to write them out um, uh, in this format. It's just a simple text file that I can uh, create the station code and then the coordinates and specify uh, the format of those coordinates. So a pretty simple Python script. Let's, uh, let's run it, but we'll change the file name. So we can say generate uh, GPS if we do dash dash, oops, dash dash help. We'll get the full list. So the first thing let's do is let's change the file name to uh, test gps.txt. Um, and let's change the number of stations. Well, let's just do 10 stations. So a very, very sparse GPS network. And you'll see what it looks like. We have our station code. I've just given it sort of a used the seismic network code naming scheme where synthetics generally have uh, a station a network code of something like ZZ, then I give a dot. Uh, in this case, I'm just using the number from of the station 0, 1 to 10, uh, X coordinate, Y coordinate, and that's all that's in that file. Um, if we look at the GPS stations, uh, it looks the same thing. Uh, you'll notice at the top, I have a comment preceded by a pound sign uh, that shows this was generated automatically with the Python script. And you'll see I have 200 stations uh, just randomly distributed, randomly given order for the points. So I think that's all of our inputs. So let's run step four.
And so this will, this is our generating our fake GPS observations that will then invert for the fault slip. So it loads up the simulation, gives the bounding box, gives the scale for non-dimensionalization, says that it's initializing, shows all of our uh, PETSI parameters, and then solves and converges in 73 iterations uh, of the uh, linear solver. Converge in one iteration for the not for the nonlinear solver. We had a final uh, tolerance of two times to the minus twelve. Let's look at these results. So um, we'll uh, fire up Paraview. That's from a previous example. Let's clear our screen. And actually, I need to restart Paraview from our appropriate directory. So. Let's fire up pair of you from our strikes up 2D directory. And it'll take a second. Start up, I think it's running. Yeah, it's running there, it's, it's getting going. So here's uh, pair of you, we can run, we need to specify so we need to get our Python inter Python shell running. We need to specify it's step four. So step four underscore variable slip. The default always starts, whoops, at uh, step one. So we can just run the script. Uh, it's in the viz directory, the plot displacement warp. So here's our uh, slip, dis uh, sorry, displacement field associated with our uh, variable slip along strike, you can see that on, we have positive y displacement on the right side, negative y displacement on the left side, so a jump. And you see we have variable slip along the fault with uh, corresponding to the highs and lows of the displacement field. Uh, and our slip is combined to this central portion uh, within 20 kilometers of the origin. So just a nice simple slip distribution and uh, displacement field that corresponding to that. So that's the data we want to invert for. Now let's set up our greens functions. And so we'll go back to our slides. That's what we ran. Uh, oops, I was going the wrong direction. There we go, run the simulation, visualize the results. Oh, I didn't show the uh, displacement field or the GPS stations. Um, so let's quickly go back and I'll show you how to do that. So we run our displacement warp again. That's that. Then we can overlay our GPS stations by running another Python script. And if we zoom in, we can see those displacement fields and it's not showing all of them, I believe. So I need to click on my glyphs come down here and we'll say uh, what the distribution is. Uh, sometimes it's a little glyph type, orientation, scale, glyph transform, there it is. So it's using, I don't want just a sampling, I want all of the points. And so that gives me this set of GPS stations, uh, the magnitude of the vector uh, shows um, is corresponding to the magnitude of the displacement. So you can see how the magnitude is just falling off. My random set, I have some very closely spaced stations, some real close to the fault. Uh, and obviously as you get farther away, the displacement field decreases. So now returning to our plot. Now we're going to compute the static fault impulses. So along the length of my fault, uh, I am going to uh, impose unit impulses and fault slip. I won't do it over the full length of fault, but I'll do it over a slightly larger area than where I had uh, my imposed my fault slip. And we'll look at that. And we can do that being that we have spatial database files that controls where we want, uh, what patch of the fault we want our or patches of the fault where we want our slip impulses to be displayed. 
So uh, basically the physics look nearly identical, only now I'm replacing a slip distribution along the fault with impulses shown down here in the bottom. So uh, for uh, to generate static greens functions, I need to change the problem type to be from being time dependent to being a greens function problem. Along with that, I need to tell it on which fault I want greens functions. I only have one fault in this case. Um, so it's pretty easy. I just give it the label and label value of that fault. And I need now need to change um, or use the default for the solution to have both the displacement and Lagrange multiplier. In this case, I need to use a basis order and quadrature order of one. Uh, it's important to use a basis order of one because I need to resolve in the output what my uh, discretization is, what my displacement field looks like. If you give a higher order, um, uh, in terms of if I, you really want the spatial variation, uh, then you can you may not be resolving it at the at the points, and so um, it's best to use a basis order of one at this point as we improve the output and can provide uh, sort of be able to support better support higher order discretizations in our output. Um, you could use a higher order basis for your um, to accept the greens functions. Uh, the rest of the information in terms of materials is the same for all the simulations in the directory, so I don't repeat it here. Same thing with our boundary conditions. For our fault, now instead of just having a fault cohesive kin object, I have fault cohesive impulses because I'm imposing impulses. And uh, I need to, uh, I don't care about fault openings, so I don't want impulses on degree of freedom zero, I just want it on the left lateral. And so that's an impulse degree of freedom one. So I'm only going to impose impulses on the left lateral degrees of freedom. Here's uh, my where I'm defining the spatial database that controls the patches of where those impulses are applied. So it's going to be in slip impulses underscore uh, dot spatial db. And my I'm going to use a basis order of one for my slip impulses. That gives the linear variation of the SIP impulses, the little hat functions around each vertex so to speak. Um, so here are my input files for my greens function. I have my mesh file, my pilot app file. That is the same as what we used in step four. Now I have step zero five for my greens functions and we'll look, look at our slip impulses. And I need to compute my greens functions at my GPS stations. So uh, I'll use that file as well. So we'll look at both the parameter file as well as the spatial distribution for uh, the slip impulses. And so let's pull up our file here. Let's look at step five, greens functions. Again, metadata at the top, output information for our file names. That's all the same. We're gonna add in the greens functions journal info to get information about where we are in our simulation for, with using the greens functions. We change the problem type tell it the, the fault that's associated with our greens functions, quadrature order, basis order, all that I've shown before in our, um, in terms of what the physics and how that applied. Again, updating our observers to include our GPS output solution points, just like we had in uh, step four. Again, GPS stations, the output like we had in step four. Now for the fault, we have the cohesive impulses, degree of freedom one, slip impulses. So this is the same information I had on the previous uh, few slides. Uh, all here uh, documented and commented in the spatial DB, uh, sorry, the .cfg file. So let's look at the slip underscore impulses .spatial database file. Now, instead of going from uh, minus 20 to 20 kilometers, I want to create a uh, distribution that in this case, I'm going to go from minus 25 to 25 kilometers. Uh, I want slip impulses over that entire section. So I give it a, a slip of one that's indicating um, the threshold, I believe, is like 0 0.1. You can look and you can, that's a user specified threshold. So you can uh, specify whether you want uh, multiple patches. You can even create um, uh, complex series of patches, but anything above the threshold is always assigned a unit impulse value. So this amplitude, I, as long as it's above the threshold, the value doesn't actually matter. 
to create a, sort of a sharp cutoff in where I imposed slip impulses. I sort of went epsilon on either side, set it to value of zero, um, and then out to the beyond the edge of the domain having amplitude zero. So anything with zero, I won't have slip impulses anywhere between minus 25 and 25. Uh, within my domain, I will have uh, slip impulses. So let's run the slip impulses through. And so that's running step five. So now instead of time stepping information, we'll see generation of slip impulses information. So you see here, it's computing the simple impulse for one of 12. It's uh, converged in 45 iterations. That first one takes a little bit of time because it's setting up the output at the solution points. Now it's running through seven, eight. I have a total of 12 impulses um, given my discretization size for going from minus 25 to 25. Uh, my nonlinear solve, instead of now saying an absolute convergence criteria, I'm not using the linear solver. I'm just telling it to do one iteration. So that's why it says converged ITS. It didn't use any of the time stepping information options that are given by the default. So it says that it ignored those at the bottom. We can now load up Paraview and look at our script. So um, we need to change this to step five greens functions. And run the script. So displacement warp. And we'll again load the GPS stations in as well. We'll zoom in in 2D. Now I can flip through and see the different impulses by incrementing time. So you can see them incremented along the fault. They don't have to be done in consecutive OI coordinates. So you need to pay attention to that in the inversion. But there you can see GPS stations that are very close get very large magnitude. If I don't have many very close to the impulses, uh, I don't see much deformation. But the, you can see it within the mesh, the red and blue uh, correspond. You can see that uh, unit impulses along the length of the fault. So now let's do our slip inversion. So we go back to our slides. There we ran the inversion. There's what it looked like for one of the impulses. So now we're gonna invert for, for the slip in step four using Green's functions computed in our step five. We're gonna use a simple linear inversion approach with a Green's function matrix unknown fault slip will be shown by D. Our a priori estimate of the fault slip is shown in D a priori. Our observed displacements are you observed, we have a penalty matrix and a penalty parameter. The Green's function matrix GIJ gives the displacement component I uh, at a location due to unit slip of uh, component J. So uh, our sort of our generalized Green's functions multiplied by our fault slip is, should be equal to our observations. We use an augmented system of equations where we include the penalty parameter and a diagonal matrix with a, a priori slip of zero. This leads to a generalized inverse shown here. So our estimated slip is the inverse of this matrix times um, our augmented observations, which is our observations and a priori slip estimates. So we can run uh, the inversions just by running uh, this Python script. Um, that uh, invert for the slip. And uh, we can take a look at that. Uh, here's what the output was, a penalty parameter. I just used three different penalty parameters, 0 0.01, get a residual norm of 0 0.06, increase the penalty parameter a bit, it uh, increases the residual, and a penalty parameter of one gives a significant, about 10 times larger residual. So a quick look at that, what that inversion script looks like. Uh, it's in this directory, it is invert slip. It's again, it's a Python application. We specify all the defaults uh, corresponding to what we'd expect. You can play around if you change like the name of output files and so forth, you'd need to update these. You can change what the default penalties are or just give them on the command line. What we're gonna do is we're gonna get the fault impulses, get the station responses, get the station observations, 
then run our inversion and write the results. Um, and we use the H, we use the HDF5 output directly instead of going through the XDMF file. We can just use the H5Py Python module to read in the responses. Here I'm reading in the fault slip impulses. I get the coordinates of those impulses. Um, I reorder them. I sort them in, in Y direction so I can keep track, uh, make sure everything's consistent. I get the station responses. I just get the displacement um, at all the GPS station locations from uh, the uh, step uh, five. Then to get the observed, that was our step four. Um, and uh, so I, again, read the displacement. And then doing the inversion, I go through, create uh, those matrices, do the inversion. I loop over all my different penalties, recreate my penalty matrix, create my generalized inverse matrix, and then I can just uh, dot everything together in terms of here I did the inversion, here I just do the multiplication of those to get uh, the, um, the impulse amplitude as well as uh, the slip uh, solution, gather the results for that particularly particular penalty value um, and save them. And then uh, when I write the results, I just write them to a, a simple text file um, with uh, a heading um, shown here. And so we can look at what that looks like. And so it's going to be step six inversion results. So I have uh, my y coordinate, what my penal, what my slip is uh, uh, for each of those. Um, and so I go from all the way over all of my uh, fault vertices from minus 75 all the way up to 75. And you can see it's revolving slip for my different penalty parameters at those locations. I can plot the results using the, the viz plot inversion results. That'll bring up uh, using matplotlib, it'll plot those inversions. And this is what it looks like. So my observed is shown in black. I have my penalty parameter 0 0.01 shown in light blue with so many GPS stations. You can see it resolved the two peaks quite well. Obviously, it didn't do uh, things exactly because of um, sort of the resolution of the uh, the slip and the GPS location of the GPS stations. Penalty parameter 0.1, it's slightly smoother, um, but only just a little bit. But as you go to a penalty parameter of one, you see it really smooth things out. So sort of an optimal value is somewhere around 0.1, probably maybe 0.2 might be uh, a little bit better in terms of uh, what you would expect to be able to resolve given the GPS stations um, and the errors in the resolution. So uh, let's go back to slides. We did the inversion. There is our inversion results. And so that completes the static greens function example. If you're interested in doing the greens functions, play around with the inversion script, play around with the plotting, play around with uh, the distribution of slip, the distribution of the GPS stations. Uh, and there's a number of exercises we list in the pilot manual um, that related to uh, this example and tutorial.